I'd like to welcome all of you to the uh, very first lecture of uh, this course on uh, multiphase flows. And uh, what I'd like to do today is basically give you an overview of the entire course so that you know exactly what you are in store for. Now, this is an advanced level course, and uh, I have been teaching this course for the last uh, four or five years. Uh, the uh, contents of this course have actually evolved uh, over these four years, uh, primarily with inputs from students. And uh, I think now the course is in a shape where there is a lot of fundamental uh, scientific approach which is being emphasized. Um, the very first time I uh, offered this course, it uh, was uh, following uh, the classical book of uh, Wallace and Wally and uh, there the emphasis was on um, using some kind of empirical correlations to calculate quantities like pressure drop when you have a multi-phase flow pattern. Now, there is hardly any of that we are going to be doing in this course. The idea is that those are concepts which you can quite easily pick up on your own should you have very strong fundamentals. And uh, keeping that in mind, uh, this course has gone through a complete overhaul. Okay. Clearly, when uh, you are talking about, so this is the first lecture on this course, multi-phase flows. Clearly, when you talk about a multi-phase flow system, you have a system where there is more than one phase. Okay? And uh, so, we have more than one phase. Usually, it is more than one fluid phase. So, it could be for example, it could be the flow of 2 immiscible liquids, an organic liquid and an aqueous liquid. So, for example, it could be water plus toluene, two li liquids or it could be flow of a liquid and a gas. For example, it could be um, carbon dioxide and uh, a gas stream containing carbon dioxide and maybe an aqua stream containing sodium hydroxide solution. So, these days you know carbon dioxide uh, oxide sequestration is extremely uh, talked about 
And uh, so you have a situation where people want to remove carbon dioxide coming from uh, processed plants. And one way to do that is to absorb it in a solution of sodium hydroxide. So you have a gas stream and a liquid stream which have to be in contact for this to occur. You can have other situations where you are talking about extraction of maybe some impurities from one liquid phase to another. And in that case, you have two liquid phases flowing um, together. And that could be an example of a water and a toluene mixture flowing, for example. You could, of course, have um, a solid phase as also being one of the phases. So you could have, we could have a gas solid multi phase flow. as in a packed bed reactor or a fluidized bed reactor. So here one of the things that happens is the solid particles can be for example catalytic and they are the sites over which the chemical reaction takes place. The reactants are usually in the gaseous phase. So if you are talking about a chemical reaction of the kind where sulphur dioxide gets converted to sulphur trioxide, this is a reversible reaction and this takes place on a catalyst of vanadium pentoxide and that is my catalyst. So this occurs in a packed bed reactor where you have solid particles okay, on which vanadium pentoxide is deposited. These particles are porous and the vanadium pentoxide is deposited on the inner surfaces of the uh, uh, pores. The reaction takes place on the site of the catalyst and uh, sulfur dioxide and air are actually let in, they diffuse into the uh, particle, the reaction takes place and the product is formed. So here is an example of a multi-phase flow where you have a solid particle and you have a gas phase. There are other uh, examples, for example, in the field of uh, catalytic cracking where fluidized bed reactors are used, where the solid particles are not stationary, but they are also moving in my reactor. So the entire reactor is in a fluidized state, the fluid phase is moving and the solid phase is also moving. So um, that would be an example of a fluidized bed reactor. So what I am just trying to tell you is that there are several situations in the chemical processing industry wherein multi-phase flows do occur and that is basically by way of trying to motivate you for uh, you know uh, going through with this course and um, seeing how the concepts that you are going to be learning in this course can be used for. Uh, analyzing some of these processes, some of these systems and uh, see if we can get a better understanding so that we can possibly um, improve the performance of these systems. So these are examples where multi-phase flows occur and uh, you could also have a system where you have all the three phases present, a gas phase, a liquid phase and a solid phase. And uh, an example of that would be actually a trickle bed reactor here all three phases are present. 
and uh, one industrial process in which a trickle bed reactor is used in today is the hydro desulfurization in the petroleum industry. So, as the name suggests, what you want to do is you want to remove the sulfur compounds present in your crude oil. And one way to do this is to react this with hydrogen. So, the hydrogen reacts with the sulfur compounds and produces hydrogen sulfide. Now, the sulfur compounds are therefore eliminated from the feed stream of the crude and what you get is petrol after the refining step with a very, very, very low sulfur content. The reason why this becomes important is tomorrow when you are driving your car or your scooter or your motorcycle and you are burning all this um, petrol, diesel, etc. The sulfur oxide emissions that you are going to let out and you are going to contribute to the atmosphere is going to be minimal. So, you do not want to pollute the atmosphere by burning these uh, sulfur containing compounds, the thiophenes, the mercaptans, etc. Okay? So, you want to remove them right at the refinery stage itself. And uh, the way this occurs is, you have again a catalyst uh, pellet, we have a catalyst and this is the solid phase. The sulfur containing compound this is the liquid phase and the hydrogen is the gas phase. Again, the reaction has to take place in a porous solid particle. So, I am just drawing a random network of pores. So, these are my pores and that is my catalyst particle. Okay. The catalyst is deposited like I told you earlier on the surface of these pores which we can assume to be cylindrical. The sulfur containing compound, the crude oil is or the fraction of crude oil, diesel, sometimes you are only processing diesel or sometimes you are only processing petrol is going to be flowing around this catalyst particle. So, that is this is your liquid stream and the hydrogen gas is going to be present outside. Okay. So, this is your liquid stream and this could be diesel for example. What we want is both diesel and hydrogen should reach the site of the catalyst for the reaction to occur. And uh, here, in order for that to take place, these pores have to be very small so that the liquid can enter the pore through basically capillary action. I want the concentration of hydrogen to be as high as possible at the site of the catalyst. In order for the concentration of hydrogen to be very high, I must have a very low resistance to the path for the of the hydrogen, so that the co concentration difference is very low. So, 
one way to ensure that the path of the, uh, the resistance to the flow of hydrogen is very low is to make sure that this film of liquid which is flowing around the catalyst particle is very thin. If the film is very thick, then you would, the hydrogen would have to diffuse to a longer distance and therefore the resistance would be much higher. So, what is done in industry is you make sure that uh, you have a very thin film. In other words, the liquid is basically trickling over the surface of the catalyst particle. Okay? So, the trickling over the surface of the catalyst particle ensures that there is a thin film, ensures that the concentration of the hydrogen is very high at the surface of the pore and you have an effective reaction. So, this is an example of a gas liquid solid system where uh, a very important process takes place okay. and uh, this basic insight of wanting to have a very high concentration of hydrogen in the surface of the pa catalyst particle has told us what should be the relative flow rates that we need for the liquid phase and the gas phase. Okay. Now, one of the objectives which uh, an engineer has is to understand questions like what is going to be the pressure drop in a system where there is more than one fluid phase flowing. Now, if you want a quick answer, you can possibly use the ideas from the single phase flows that you have studied and try to adapt them to the multi phase flow context. For instance, if you have a two phase flow okay, of a liquid liquid system, you may be able to calculate things like an effective density and an effective viscosity for the two phase mixture. So, you may take a weighted average of the density and the viscosity and treat it as a pseudo homogeneous fluid as a single phase fluid and then use whatever knowledge you have about calculating pressure drops for single phase systems, use these average properties and estimate the pressure drop. Now, this is one way by which you can uh, try to um, solve the problem. Of course, the basic assumption of whether the uh, weighted average is uh, going to work or not is not something which uh, we can know uh, a priori. So, what you would do is you would get an estimate and then you would actually do an ex experiment and see if this estimate is accurate to what you uh, are actually finding in an experiment. There could be a mismatch or there could be a match, but there is no guarantee that there would be a match because you have made an approximation. So, what we want to do is we want to see if we can get away from this kind of an ad hoc approach, this kind of a semi empirical approach. So, the semi empiricism comes because of this ad hocism that has uh, basically been uh, used uh, in addressing this question. And can we go for something more fundamental? Okay. Uh, let me just uh, go back one second and uh, to this problem of this. Uh, Park bed reactors and maybe even to the problem of the trickle bed reactor where the solid is in uh, a stationary uh, phase. So, typically if you were to calculate the pressure drop, you would calculate the pressure drop using the Ergens relationship in a packed bed reactor. Okay. Now, but that only gives you an idea of 
the macroscopic phenomena, the pressure drop versus the flow rate or the velocity of the system. What you want to do is possibly get a more detailed insight about what is exactly happening in the system and that is going to be the focus of this course. So, by way of motivation for processes where multiphase flow systems exist, I have just given you this, uh, these examples. Okay. And uh, what I am going to tell you now is as far as this course is concerned, we will adopt a more fundamental approach in analyzing problems. In particular, we are not going to be using any correlations at all in this course. Although we have a very complex problem with multiphase uh, systems, we will not be using any correlations. So, for example, to give you an idea of the liquid liquid flow problem that we mentioned earlier in the context of extraction, there are different possible flow regimes in a liquid liquid flow system. So, for example, you could have the liquids in a tube flowing side by side or you could have drops of one liquid flowing in uh, suspended in another liquid or you could have big slugs of one liquid um, you know flowing in a periodic manner with the other phase uh, in between these slugs. So, there are different possible flow regimes. One is, I am just giving you some examples, one is a stratified flow. So, here the fluids flow side by side. So, if you have a pipe or a channel, you will have phase 1 here and have phase 2 here. That is an example of a stratified flow. You could have a slug flow. Here, you would have slugs of one fluid and this is the second fluid and then you have another slug of the first fluid and this is the second fluid. So, that so, the 1 represents one of the fluid phases could be toluene, 2 represents another fluid phase could be water okay. and you have these uh, slugs which are all of a uniform size you know uh, surrounded by the aqueous phase which is the continuous phase. So, basically this is a dispersed phase, this is a discontinuous phase because one slug of uh, let us say the organic phase and this is the aqueous phase. The organic phase is the discontinuous phase and the aqueous phase is the continuous phase and uh, if then this basically depends upon the material of your pipe. So, if you have glass then glass is weighted by water and so there is a possibility for the uh, continuous phase to be the aqueous phase. Now, um, you could also the when I talk about slug what I mean is that the slug occupies almost the entire cross section of the pipe. So, this is my pipe, this is the cross section of my pipe 
Okay? And here, this is the cross section of my pipe. The slug occupies the entire cross section of the pipe and there is going to be a very thin film which is going to exist between the wall of the slug and the wall of the pipe. So, this is a thin film. And I think I will just talk about one more flow regime, the droplet flow regime. where we have drops of one liquid in another. So, here we have this pipe and we have drops and this is your maybe an organic phase and this is your continuous or aqueous phase. The difference between the droplet flow and the slug flow is that the, the size of the dispersed phase. Here the size of the dispersed phase is much smaller than the size of the channel. Okay? The size of the dispersed phase in the slug flow occupies the is comparable to the size of the channel. Here the size of the dispersed phase, the organic phase is much smaller than the size of the channel. Now, one of the questions which we want to know is we want to be able to predict on the basis of the properties and the operating conditions, things like the flow rate, what is going to be the flow regime present in my system, in my channel, in my pipe. In the past, what people have done is they have done exper uh, extensive experimental investigations and uh, they have depicted the different flow regimes in something like a two dimensional parameter uh, space. So, for example, for a given combination of um, liquids and for a given pipe diameter, you could uh, find out for different combinations of the flow rates, what is going to be the pattern of the flow. Okay? So, if you have a very, very low um, flow rate of the organic phase and high flow rate of the aqueous phase, you might expect something like a droplet flow. Okay? So, this is in the low organic largest thing. Uh, as you keep increasing the organic phase flow rate, you might want to go towards a or you might observe a transition from a droplet flow regime to a slug flow regime. And uh, may, if you were to increase the flow rates further, you would get a stratified flow regime. So, basically what I am trying to tell you is for a given combination of liquids, which means the properties of the liquids are fixed, the density and the viscosity. Depending upon the flow rates, you are going to see these different flow patterns. And uh, of course, one way to do this uh, study is by just doing a bunch of experiments, making observations and then coming up with uh, things like, uh, you know, some kind of a boundary wherein you would say, uh, uh, you know, this is the uh, re re region where I am going to get a droplet flow regime, this is the region where I am going to get a slug flow regime, this is the region where I am going to get a stratified flow regime. Remember, this is just to illustrate the idea. Okay? So, please do not uh, take this figure for, you know, being uh, uh, actually observed in experiment. This is just to tell you that there are boundaries in this parameter space which demarcate the different flow regimes. Okay? So, the question now is, okay, I can do this experimentally. Is it possible for me to determine these boundaries 
determine these changes in these flow patterns using some kind of a theoretical framework. And uh, the answer is yes and what you are going to learn in this course is basically this theoretical framework which helps you understand not only the answer to this question, but a whole bunch of questions which are going to be of a similar nature. Okay? So, our objective is to see if I can predict this boundary where the transition occurs from one flow regime to another. Okay? And just to tell you how we are going to do it, we are going to do this by looking at what is called the stability of a particular flow. Okay? So, the theoretical framework developed will help us understand and predict the boundary or transition from one flow pattern to another. Okay. So, as far as this course is concerned, our focus is mainly on um, getting both a physical understanding as well as a applying mathematics to get a quantitative uh, understanding of the particular system. So, when we talk about physical understanding, I am talking about you know analyzing a specific problem and talking about the physics of that problem. The mathematics and the mathematical framework that we are going to be establishing is sufficiently general, so that you can actually apply this mathematical framework to any system and uh, only thing is the inferences are going to be different for different systems because the physics is going to be different. So, one of the things we are going to focus on in this course is both the mathematical approach as well as the physical understanding. You need to have both and uh, normally what happens is when you do your math courses, you uh, learn a lot of the mathematical techniques you do not see what the relevant physics is. When you do a physical problem, you possibly are applying a very specific technique and you do not realize how general it is the mathematical technique that you are using. So, you are going to learn not only mathematical techniques which are sufficiently general, but you are also going to be applying these techniques to a host of problems which will arise in the context of engineering and so that you can actually see applications of uh, whatever you are learning. Okay? So, we will use both a physical and a mathematical approach. to analyze a system. Okay? So, um, these go hand in hand. As a result, since we want to do both mathematics as well as physics, both mathematics as well as physics. We are going to be focusing mainly on trying to keep the model as simple as possible, retain all the important physics, so that we can 
develop a much better understanding of the problem, physical understanding of the problem and look for analytical or semi-analytical solutions which are not computationally intensive. So, I am trying to get the best of both worlds. I am trying to get the best of both worlds in the sense I am trying to get quantitative information by doing mathematics. I am trying to deepen my understanding of the physical problem by retaining important physics, throwing out all the not important effects okay. and uh, this helps me focus on what I think is important physically and the mathematics gives me quantitative results. And since I have thrown out all the unwanted physics, I can possibly aspire to get analytical or semi-analytical solutions. So, that my reliance, uh, 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 my reliance on the computers, on computationally intensive methods is actually reduced, okay. So, there is a completely uh, uh, different approach here as compared to what people in classical computational fluid mechanics use. We focus on getting the best of both worlds, retain the important physics. simplify the equations okay then solve the equations analytically so we do not have A computationally intensive approach. This is as opposed to computational fluid dynamics because multiphase flows can also be analyzed using CFD techniques. Okay, CFD computational fluid dynamics. usually invokes the solution of detailed equations. So, this is a computationally intensive approach as a result of which the physical understanding that we may get is lost. So, usually when people are using computationally intensive approaches, they may be going towards software packages and uh, the software packages uh, if used properly would give you accurate results. If you do not use them properly, you, you may get erroneous results and it would be very difficult for you to find out if the results coming from these packages are indeed right. One of the things you are going to do in the course is come up with solutions uh, for physical problems under some circumstances, under some limiting circumstances. So, these solutions are going to be analytical. What you can do is you can verify these analytical solutions using the computational uh, packages that are available and see if uh, the results coming from the computational packages are indeed um, the same as what you get from your analytical solutions. So, what I am trying to advocate here is that the computational packages, computational fluid uh, dynamic packages like fluent definitely have their virtues and are important, but one should be very careful in using these packages 
because if you do not use these packages carefully, you are going to get erroneous results. Definitely you would get results, okay, you would get some velocity fields, you would get some pressure fields, but you need to develop the ability to make sure that the results that are coming are right. You need to be able to, you know, figure out if those results are indeed accurate, whether they are actually worth their weight in gold. To do this, you may want to run the same package under some um, simplifying situations like maybe very low Reynolds numbers or so that the um, turbulence is eliminated. Then you would be able to possibly get an analytical solution like your laminar flow, the parabolic velocity profile in a pipe. See if the computational package gives you the same parabolic velocity profile. So under low uh, Reynolds numbers, if it does, then when you actually use the same package for high Reynolds number flows, you have more confidence. So that of course was a very simplistic example, but you could have situations which are more complicated wherein the getting an analytical solution, something analogous to your parabolic velocity profile is very important to validate results coming from computational packages. So uh, and that is the reason why we in this course are going to actually use this kind of a two pronged attack trying to simplify equations, concentrate on important physics, try to get the simplified equations, solve them in an analytical manner and if you cannot solve them analytically, at least solve them numerically but not com very computationally intensive and get results. So you would therefore in this course necessarily get to a, a point where you would have to solve some of the problems writing programs in some of these packages like MATLAB or Mathematica or Maple or Fortran, whatever suits you, okay. So as far as this particular course is concerned, this is what we are going to be doing. We are going to be looking at uh, situations, simplifying the equations and retain the important physics and try to answer important questions which are of engineering interest like can you predict the transition from one flow regime to another flow regime? Are you in a position where you can predict how you can go from the droplet flow to the slug flow or from the slug flow to the stratified flow? If you can predict this, then you can actually validate that using experiments. If you are not in a position to do experiments, then you can possibly predict, uh, validate this particular prediction of this boundary by doing computations on a package like Fluent, okay, and see if the uh, results of your prediction are indeed validated by the computational experiments on the computer. So, coming to a little bit of the details of this course. Um, we would in fact mainly be talking about laminar flows, focus is on laminar flows, okay. And we would look at doing a small recap for just to make sure that this course is self consistent. So we would recap the governing equations of the fluid flow and I am going to do this in the context of using things like the Reynolds transport theorem and see how we can get the Navier-Stokes equation. One of the th important challenges that you are going to face when you are so solving multiphase flow problems is in, in analyzing. boundary conditions. When you have a change from a stratified flow to a slug flow, the boundary itself 
is going to change. Normally what you are used to is solving problems where the boundary is fixed. So the boundary does not change. Now we want to be in a position to be able to track how the interface, the boundary between two liquids is actually going to change with time and position. So we need to track the interface, how does it evolve with time and space. And uh, you are used to using boundary conditions of a particular kind, continuity of velocities, continuity of tangential stresses. And in the past what you have done is you have not worried too much of the existence of the surface tension along the interface. Now the presence of the surface tension is actually going to modify these classical boundary conditions that you are used to. For example, if you have a curved interface, there is going to be a pressure gradient and the normal stresses are not going to be balanced because the surface tension force is present at the interface. If the, there is a concentration gradient of let us say a surfactant along an interface, the surface tension is going to vary along the interface. There is going to be a gradient of the surface tension and this is going to also cause a inequality between of the tangential stresses across the interface. So these generalizations to the existence of a surface tension, to the existence of a surface tension gradient, to the existence of a curvature of the interface and how the boundary conditions are formulated in this scenario is what we are going to talk about. Okay, and that's extremely important. So how to include surface tension? surface tension gradients and the curvature of the interface. Finally, and this is possibly the application part where we are going to talk about the application of methods like perturbation theory and linear stability analysis okay, to specific problems. Now I spoke about you know getting analytical solutions and what we are doing when you talk about analytical solutions is we use these simplified equations here. We use these general equations which we simplify depending upon a specific problem and use this perturbation approach and the linear stability approach where you actually convert a bunch of nonlinear equations to linear equations and then uh, try to analyze them. The idea is that linear equations is something which we all know how to analyze using things like Laplace transform, using things like Fourier transform, okay, and we can hope to get analytical solutions and get insight. So that is basically the focus of the course. What the perturbation theory tells you is it helps you construct approximate solutions which are analytical okay. and what we do is we exploit the presence of things like small parameters in the space. 
uh, in, in the operating conditions, in the governing equations. And I can actually construct solutions. So this, the perturbation theory, helps construct approximate solutions, okay, and uh, the linear stability can be found by solving the linearized equations. So I think at the end of the course, what I expect is that the students would have actually uh, gotten enough knowledge that when they go to the library and pick up a journal and look at a paper, they will be in a position to be able to derive those equations and to be able to understand uh, what this paper is talking about, to understand the physics explained in the paper, to understand the mathematics explained in the paper, and to be able to do research in this area. And I think the course itself will consist of uh, in-class exams where we will be testing your fundamental knowledge that you gained in this course. We'll have computer assignments where we will you know, make you solve problems on the computer. And of course, a final exam, which would uh, again test your fundamental knowledge. Thank you very much.